A very good evening to everybody and a very warm welcome to Money Life Foundation's fourth Right to Information lecture to be delivered by India's foremost public intellectual today. That is Dr. Pradab Banu Mehta. Dr. Mehta has intriguingly chosen to title his talk as the collapse of civil society, reflection on democracy and the public sphere. The collapse of civil society is a very, are very strong words and very strong sentiment, which has raised a lot of curiosity among activists and civil society members. So we do eagerly look forward to Dr. Mehta expounding on this theme. We are also most honored that Mr. Nikhil Day and Professor Ritu Dewan have accepted our invitation to be discussants in today's program. They shall be sharing the thoughts on the topic post Dr. Mehta's lecture. This event has been organized by Money Life Foundation's RTI Center, which works at educating and empowering people through the RTI Act. The center is able to achieve its goals due to the support and participation of some of India's best known and most dedicated RTI activists. I'm delighted to have almost all of them here with us today. The RTI Center was established through the gracious support of Mr. Dinesh Thakur, the renowned Ranbaxy whistleblower, who is with us today from the US at an unearthly hour. A heartfelt thanks to him for helping us with this center and this program. I would also like to thank our knowledge partner, the Leaflet, for supporting this program. Today's topic is very important in our present turbulent times, and we are thankful to Dr. Mehta for taking time out from his very busy schedule to speak at our event. Dr. Mehta is a renowned public intellectual and political scientist. He holds a BA first class in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford, and is a PhD in politics from Princeton. Dr. Mehta has been a professor at the New York University School of Law, a visiting professor of government at Harvard University, associate professor of government and social studies at Harvard, and for a brief period, Professor of Philosophy and of Law and Governance at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. His areas of research include political theory, constitutional law, society and politics in India, governance and political economy, as well as international affairs. He's also been the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University and has served as the President of the Center for Policy Research, a New Delhi based think tank. Throughout his career, Dr. Mehta has deeply engaged in public affairs and has been part of many government committees. He was previously member convener of the Prime Minister of India's National Knowledge Commission and a member of the Supreme Court appointed committee on elections in Indian universities. He has authored a number of papers and reports for leading Indian and international agencies. He's published several books and articles on political theory, constitutional law, governance, and political economy. Dr. Sir, Dr. Mehta serves on the editorial board of American Political Science Review and Journal of Democracy, and is a visiting professor at Princeton. He is the recipient of Malcolm Adi Shashaya Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Social Sciences in 2010, the prestigious Infosys Prize in 2011 for Contribution to Political Science, and the Amartya Sen Award for Social Sciences in 2013. In its citation, the jury for the Infosys Prize, chaired by Dr. Amartya Sen, said this in said, said about Dr. Mehta as follows: Dr. Pradab Banu Mehta has established himself as one of India's finest scholars and public minds, who has inspired a new generation of intellectual inquiry. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for accepting our invitation once again. India especially needs your words of wisdom right now, and we are certain your insights on the current state of public affairs in India will be very thought provoking and interesting to all of us. Before I invite Dr. Mehta to begin his lecture, some quick ground rules for our viewers. Except our speakers, everybody else will be on mute. For best viewing, we recommend staying on active speaker mode. The chat facility is the best way to communicate with organizers during the session and the raised hand button may be used during the discussion. This program is being recorded and will also be available on YouTube channel. That is Money Life Foundation's YouTube channel. It's also being simultaneously live streamed on Facebook. Turning off your video allows you to view the session without your home and background being visible. I now have the pleasure of requesting 
Dr. Mehta to kindly deliver his talk. Thank you, uh, Devashish, and thank you, uh, Money Life Foundation, uh, particularly Suthi, Suthi, Sucheta ji for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I must confess, when I first received uh, this invitation, uh, I was a little intimidated, uh, partly looking at the list of speakers who preceded me, uh, who've mostly been jurists, and this is something I will reflect on in a second. Uh, uh, I think the, the 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 transition from sort of eminent legal luminaries to a curmudgeonly political scientist uh, itself calls for some um, uh, some kind of reflection. Uh, but I was also very excited, uh, particularly at the commentators and the discussants uh, for this program. Nikhil Day, whose uh, work uh, in civil society is legendary, is an inspiration to so many, and Professor Ritu Devan, who's constantly pointing us to what the questions, important questions in India's political economy are. So I look at this as an opportunity to learn. Uh, I'm not sure I have words of wisdom. In fact, one of the themes of my analysis is going to be that uh, I think at some senses we are in such uncharted territory. And I think we are going through the motions of pretending that we intellectually understand our context and our circumstances. Um, and that perhaps what we need is a different kind of collective deliberation uh, to help us see through this particular moment. Now, as I was thinking of what might be a good theme to discuss uh, on an occasion such as this, um, and particularly given the extraordinary work that Money Life Foundation has done, uh, given the really heroic achievement in some senses of the RTI movement and individual RTI activists, I thought it might be worth our while to step back from the current moment a little bit and think about the context in which something like RTI arose, right? Uh, what is it about India? What were the background conditions that we took for granted? Can we take any of those conditions for granted as we move forward? Uh, and broadly speaking, just to give a kind of one second summary and then I'll kind of elaborate it out over the next 45 to 50 minutes, uh, I'm basically going to argue that in some senses, the period from broadly speaking 1991, uh, you know, just to use economic reforms as a kind of benchmark, uh, to roughly 2014, represented a very distinctive kind of political regime in India. That regime has now been decisively overturned, and we are in fact entering uh, almost a new kind of political regime. And I use the word regime advisedly because it, it, it signals a certain kind of distribution of power. Uh, a new kind of political regime whose contours we still don't fully understand. And one of the features of this new regime, one of the features of this new regime is that it will demand progressively more and more control over civil society. The idea that civil society can act as this autonomous space independently of the state, acting as a pressure group outside of it. Uh, one of the things we've learned shockingly, or perhaps not surprisingly over the last few, few years, uh, is that there is no such thing as Indian civil society. And that's the thesis I'm going to try and kind of defend uh, uh, in the rest of this talk. Okay? So let's begin. So wind the clock back, right? let's say 2004, right? Uh, you know, when the first UPA one came to power, but you could even argue, you know, you could take 1999, you could take any of those kind of dates. It's not particularly important for, for the purpose of my argument. And look at the big picture. When you looked at India from a 30,000 feet view, of course, India has lots of problems, lots of dynamism, uh, you know, deep sort of, social churning, I mean, all of those things that are part of the modernization process of any society. But broadly speaking, in five areas of our collective life, we were operating within the following paradigm. Okay? So we had a state and we assumed by and large that the state despite the fact that it sometimes arbitrarily exercises power, despite the fact that it sometimes betrays the promise of liberal constitutionalism in India, but it is broadly a state 
that derives its legitimacy in part from being embedded in a constitutional representative process and structure, right? As I said, it can sometimes flagrantly violate it, right? But we took the Indian constitution for granted and we took it to be the case that the framework of the Indian constitution provides some kind of ameliorative redress uh, for the kinds of challenges and problems we face. Right? When we looked at the state itself, 2004, when UPA1 came to power, there was enormous optimism that we could think of a new architecture for state accountability, right? That would be based on five principles. And I think that's the context of the RTI movement. I think it's important to recall at this point. The first principle was that we need to move the state from structures of vertical accountability, right? Where parts of the state are responsive to or accountable to only people higher up in the state. So we move the state from a structure of vertical accountability to a structure of horizontal accountability. The state is responsible and responsive to the citizens, right? Uh, it doesn't matter whether you please your bosses in government or you please your higher up in the IAS. What matters is at the end of the day, whether you're horizontally accountable to citizens, right? And a lot of the kind of stuff that we tried to create in that period, you know, independent regulatory institutions, uh, RTI Act was largely in this spirit, right? The second principle was that, and this is very central to the RTI movement uh, as well, but most more broadly speaking, um, secrecy, right? The lack of information and knowledge broadly understood was itself a big impediment in producing an accountable state. And we wanted a regime where we shifted from, in a sense, secrecy to transparency, right? Transparency was the cornerstone, maybe the necessary condition of accountability, even if it wasn't the sufficient condition, right? The third thing we were trying to achieve in our institutional designs was the state has vast discretionary powers, all kinds of discretionary powers, right? It has discretionary power over who to arrest. It has discretionary power over granting of land, mineral licenses, you know, all kinds of permissions and prohibitions that the state used to grant at its discretion. And as a society, we began to say that this discretion needs to be governed by some conception of public reason. Look, the state will always have to exercise discretion. I mean, you know, otherwise we could replace the state with an algorithm. Decisions do have to be made, but they must be accountable and subject to some kind of public reason where the discretionary exercise of state power is one that is viewed as legitimate by all stakeholders, right? So you create processes of consultation and a lot of sort of, you know, energy was kind of expended trying to think of pre-consultative pro processes in parliament. Uh, can courts be, right? A mechanism of both horizontal accountability uh, and in some senses, you know, impose public reason on government and, you know, in its kind of pretty inept and arbitrary way, the Supreme Court tried to do it, for example, uh, uh, in the mining scams. But broadly speaking, the shift has to be from discretion to public reason. Remember, this was also the period where there was much more talk of decentralization, right? The 73rd, 74th Amendment had been enacted, you know, a couple of decades before. But certainly in public discourse, right, the sense that Indian villages and Indian cities needed to be made part of an inclusive governance structure where power was devolved at the right level. You know, the mantra used to be funds, functions, and functionaries, right? At the central level, state level, and decentralized level, panchayat, urban local bodies. At least that was beginning to be back on the agenda. Uh, we didn't make too much headway on it. No state government really wants to devolve power to the panchayats or urban local bodies. But nevertheless, right, that's the transition we wanted to make. Centralization to decentralized and therefore more inclusive governance. And finally, an increase in state capacity. 
right? That in part, what good governance would require is not just the state getting out of different areas of public life, but in some areas it would require that the state capacity be actually built up. It could be regulatory capacity, let's say in you know, organizations like SEBI, uh, it could be the capacity to in some senses deliver goods and services, health, education, you know, all those kinds of things, right? So broadly speaking, you know, these are the kind of five principles in which I think all of us probably gathered around here actually worked, uh, you know, MKSS, the RTI movement, you know, it was an absolutely fabulous revolutionary moment for accountability. Journalists were working in some senses that mode, let's try and produce horizontal accountability for the state. Think tanks were, you know, we were all kind of thinking of reforming the state in these directions, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard even to remember, right? That kind of sort of, you know, movement towards a structure of the state. So that was broadly about the state, right? That's how we thought of the state. And that's the direction in which we wanted to move. Second in politics, right? Uh, by and large, we assumed since 1991, I mean, there's this famous Rudolph's thesis about Indian politics that Indian politics will broadly remain centrist. And by centrist, one doesn't here mean, you know, between left and right, although clearly it also has that connotation. But centrist as in a certain kind of institutional imagination about how politics functions. So centrism, first of all, means a commitment to electoral secularism, at least, whether people are privately secular, uh, whether people genuinely believe secularism or not is a different matter, but at least in some senses for the purposes of some kind of electoral legitimation, uh, there has to be some kind of commitment to electoral secularism. You will not be able to govern India, for example, if you do not at least give minorities some kind of voice. And there was always at least one political party that would stake that ground in our politics, right? Uh, again, I'm not arguing that secularism was not betrayed as a principle, but broadly speaking, the dynamics of coalition building were such that we thought kind of electoral secularism would in the end triumph. There'd be local riots, there'd be opportunistic uses of communal violence here and there, but the electoral set, you know, center would hold, devolve around secularism. Second, we assumed that there was a kind of natural distribution of social power in Indian society, right? Uh, different regions, different castes, I mean, all kinds of, you know, different social groupings that have a certain kind of political valence and identity, right? And that the distribution of power amongst these groups, right, would act as a natural check and balance against the centralization of social power. So for example, in the 1990s, we often used to say, you know, caste is an antidote to Hindutva. Again, I'm not making a claim about the legitimacy of legitimacy of either ideology, right? But in a sense, it was symptomatic, right? That look, India is just too divided. It's, it's too complicated. There are too many cross-cutting cleavages for any political ideology to in some senses, right? Actually take it over and transform. So there was that kind of sensibility that, you know, the checks and balances did not come from each of us being principled. The check and balances did not come from the fact that we were all nice liberal secularists, the checks and balances came from the fact that no particular group, no particular political party, no social group could actually hope to dominate India, right? Yeah, these too many cross cutting cleavages. Because of this distribution of power, there was also a little bit more formal deference to institutional pluralism. Right, which is absolutely central to thinking about what does what do we mean by institutional pluralism? Institutional pluralism, in a sense, involves the thought, very central to liberal constitutionalism, that each sphere of society, right, capital, state, academia, civil society, you know, professions, they have their own autonomous logic, right? They have their own rules of legitimation what legitimizes a university performing the function of education, 
right? And presumably shaped by professional educationists, right? Okay. Now, of course, in practice, in practice, right, this autonomy was always violated at the margins. But our ground of critiquing the state was always, in a sense, resting back that autonomy, right? Of, in a sense, these different spheres. There are these, you know, judiciary, right? Don't interfere with the judiciary. The idea is that the rule of law has an autonomous, autonomous dynamic of its own. It has its own forms and purposes, right? right? It has its own mode of legitimation. And it should, in a sense, be protected from both the state, at least the political executive, and capital, the influence of money, right? I mean, that's, that's what defines our normal, normative horizons about institutions uh, in these matters. And last and finally, uh, the role of violence in society. Now, Indian society has always exhibited uh, at least deep structural violence. Uh, there's no denying the fact that violence has often been a mode of social control in our society. Uh, the state itself has often opportunistically used violence. And in some cases, Kashmir, uh, most famously the Northeast, uh, for example, uh, 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 the Indian state has acted often uh, as a repressive state denying rights of democratic self-governance, right? Uh, and often that kind of repression has provoked a backlash. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, in some senses, violence has almost always been a reaction to Indian state repression. Uh, um, and whenever the Indian state has tried democratic incorporation, it has more or less actually, I think, been a lot more successful than when it decided, you know, tried repression. So there was at least the sense that, right, I mean, despite the fact that we went through, you know, extraordinary communal violence in the 1980s, uh, secessionist movements in the 1980s, uh, um, uh, you know, Punjab, Kashmir, Northeast, a broad confidence that the way to keep India together, ultimately in the final analysis, is through democratic incorporation, not through the legitimization of violence and repression as an instrument of state policy. That doesn't mean the state might not use it against you know, particular groups, 1984, 2002, uh, the enormous scandal of the fact that no justice was meted out in those cases. But the sense that you cannot keep the Indian project together without some form of democratic incorporation. Okay? So that is broadly the political horizon in which we kind of operated, right? I mean, we were trying to, in a sense, improve on this structure, our critique of the state, right? Sort of was premised on taking the centrist se se sensibility for granted. The third large theme we assume, so there's the state structure, there's this political sensibility, then there's the economy, which I want to say a quick word about, uh, maybe we can take this more up in, in, in discussion. Post-1991, uh, I mean, which we again conveniently use as a kind of reforms, you know, the start of the reforms process, by and large, right, a strange thing happened to, I think, our political thinking about the economy, okay? What do I mean by that? I don't want to go into a discussion over sort of, you know, the legitimacy of our economic model, uh, how successful it was. Uh, it is not a, this is not a scorecard of India's economy. Uh, but there was a certain way in which we started thinking about the economy. So at an elite level, right? There was a certain kind of wish for depoliticization of the economy, right? So, and you know, this is consistent with the imagination of the state that I've just outlined. What do we mean by depoliticization? The economy can, literally speaking, never be depoliticized. Politicians will always care about subsidies. They'll always care about inflation. Uh, you know, they'll always care about potential economic discontent, right? So I don't mean in a literal sense, of course, no economy, economy can be depoliticized. But I think there was an approach to managing the economy, 
right? That took it for granted that we knew what the fundamental direction of economic reform should be, greater integration into the, into the world economy, removal of wasteful subsidies, getting the state out of right, areas where uh, it should not belong, the kind of dismantling of the license permit Raj, uh, which was supposed to also pay a governance dividend by reducing the discretionary power of the state. right. And the only way in which we could conceptualize opposition to reform, right, was that what stands in the way of reform, what stands in the way of reform is not genuine disagreement over the direction of where we want to go. What stands in the way of reform is vested interests, right? I mean, if you've ever kind of looked at an economist blog or, you know, it's always, look, we kind of know where India needs to go, right? We need to remove subsidy X, we need to, you know, sort of reform regulation Y. And what prevents this from happening? Economic vested interests. I mean, vested interests, in a sense, were to economic thinking, what in a sense, anti-nationals are to nationalism, right? The only way in which you could explain discontent, right? And, you know, this is something you can see even in the farmers movement, right? In some sense, the construction of the farmers movement no matter which side you are on, on the debate of reform um, and, you know, uh, the fact that whenever there is opposition, right, to particular reform measures, the only language in which we can comprehend it is not, here is a genuine disagreement about the economic model we need to pursue, right, which civil society needs to, in a sense, mediate through intellectual conversation. It's really about, there must be some vested interests. And, and the only political problem is how do you manage these vested interests, right? So in the economic sphere, there was a certain kind of closure, if you might say, of the kind of intellectual space. The only way in which you can conceptualize disagreement was, as I said, by projecting it as a vested interest. But even at the bottom end of the spectrum, right? Uh, a kind of interesting thing happened, and I think all of us were complicit in this in some respects, or at least many of us, where the social contract was supposed to be simple. The state will give capital more free reign, capital produces growth, right? Uh, if we are lucky, we might do it transparently, but broadly speaking, the state produces growth. The gains from that growth, through increased tax revenue accrues to the state and the state then uses those revenues for creating opportunities for those who are left behind in this structure of growth, right? Uh, it provides services, it, you know, health, education, et cetera, et cetera, right? Whole range of things. Now, most of the focus of civil society during that period, right? was in trying to produce accountability in the delivery of state services. We were sort of under laborers to saying, look, the state needs to provide service X, it needs to provide food, it needs to provide this service, it needs to provide Y service. And the function of civil society, right, in some ways is to produce the kind of countervailing pressure and transparency that these services can be provided much more efficiently, right? So civil society was doing social audits of Narega programs, you know, we were filing RTI applications, but by and large, right? It, the framework was, there's a bunch of services the state needs to provide, let us hold the state accountable, okay? And this was the comfort zone in which we were operating, okay? So this is kind of our, our approach to the economies. I'll, 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 in society, as I said, I've already indicated, I won't dwell in, de dwell, de delve into this much. We assumed, particularly because of caste and regional configurations, that there is a kind of natural division of power in Indian society that has deep social roots, right? And part of our political imagination in a sense was shaped by how do you build electoral coalitions 
in the face of these cross-cutting social identities. Right? But we by and large took these, the existence of these social identities for granted, right? That you know, caste will take the particular form it does. Uh, and we also assumed that the social identities and the distribution of social power will prevent the concentration of power and the emergence of any single hegemonic ideology, right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of ironic that we thought of kind of in that sense, caste in a political sense, at least as a progressive force. Uh, there was also a particular logic to it. Uh, this was the period where you had the emergence of caste parties in North India, you had the rise of regional parties, and in some senses, the party structure also reflected the social fragmentation. We thought this was a good thing for democracy. And in some senses, it was. I mean, it was a good thing for democracy because it allowed a certain form of political inclusion. Uh, it was also a good thing for democracy because democracy survived by a distribution of social power. They don't survive by rules or good intentions. Yeah. And last and finally, in this broad thing, so we've done state, politics, economy, society, culture. Uh, nationalism has always been important in India. Uh, nationalism has always been important in pretty much every modern nation state. India is no exception to this. Right? But I think in the beginning, in the middle of the mid, mid 2000s, right, we began to have the sense that the form that Indian nationalism could take and be institutionalized in. One, our kind of, you know, our masculine urge to be sort of recognized by the global community in some senses, right? Nationalism demands a form of recognition. That form of recognition could be sublimated by all these other nice developments that are happening in the economy, 8% growth, India finally arriving at the world stage, right? This, this immense moment of national self-confidence, right? Uh, but also, that these kind of dynamic changes in India's economy, in India's politics, in India's society would in some senses reduce the pressure on thinking of Indian nationalism largely in terms of victimhood. Right. Okay. Now, and I'll, I'll come to this argument in, in, two, in a couple of minutes kind of to elaborate on it. But if you now fast forward to the present moment, right? One of the things I think perhaps most of you will agree on that all of these assumptions that we made about, you know, the background conditions of our collective life have completely and utterly collapsed, okay? Uh, the state, is in fact regressing on all the dimensions I mentioned. Instead of horizontal accountability, we have more work accountability. Instead of more transparency, we have more secrecy. Instead of more decentralization, we have more centralization. The only thing in which the state has progressed arguably is state capacity, right? Yeah. In politics, centrism has collapsed not just as a political idea, right? There is no political party in India, maybe at the margins TMC because of its particular origins in Bengal, but there's virtually no political party that now even subscribes to electoral secularism, that even thinks it important to be the case that, right? You cannot have an inclusive democracy without giving minorities some voice and representation, okay? It's gone, not a single political party, not even Congress, okay? It's, it's even afraid to say the M word, okay? Uh, the former deference to institutional pluralism that I talked about, right? Where broadly speaking, our institutional imagination was that each sphere of our social existence has an logic of its own, and that a vibrant pluralistic democracy at least respects the core of that logic. Right? Uh, 
I was joking that, you know, as a political scientist speaking after a bunch of lawyers and, and, and judges. And I think there is something perhaps sort of poignant about it because I have to say uh, that when I walk into a classroom these days and somebody asks me, what is the Indian constitution? I cannot tell you what the Indian constitution is. I just cannot tell you with a straight face. I mean, I can show you the text. I can, you know, recite our, our kind of standard political theory, constitutional law training, uh, but I cannot tell you what, what the Indian constitution is. Uh, there is a legal system that exists, right? But rule of law turns out to be a virtue of a legal system, not a property of a legal system, right? There is a constitution that exists, right? But you cannot, on the basis of that constitution, predict or even count on even the ability to make a rights claim, right? So if political centrism collapsed in the economy, again, I'm not talking about economics, I'm just talking about the political approach to the economy. Post 2009, that optimism, I think we had in that 8% growth period, right? Growth is chugging along. Now, if we could just produce an accountable state, right? Just get the RTIs in, just get the independent regulators in, just get the Supreme Court working, you know, India's all set, right? Post-2009 financial crisis, that confidence in the economy began to collapse. What 2009 exposed in a kind of broader sense was that while certainly the Indian economy had gained a great deal in the 2000s. I mean, the growth was for real. The growth did produce some gains. Uh, Indian infrastructure did improve. But what that growth was not able to do was to resolve the fundamental contradictions and inequalities inherent in Indian society, in the Indian economy, right? In some senses, we mistook a very lucky conjuncture in the mid 2000s when the entire world was growing, when you could count on export growth, where you could induce growth by producing some low hanging fruit in regulatory reform. We just assumed that that's our manifest destiny. I mean, you would go to the planning commission, Nikhil Dame, I remember in those days, uh, you know, we used to sit around saying, uh, or here, look, India's savings rate has hit 34%. I mean, what can stop India, right? Uh, so the only thing is, you know, how do you kind of translate this into tax revenues and get all the social service delivery architecture in place, right? But the fundamental truth is on employment, on sustainable, sustaining an 8% growth trajectory, the fundamental contradictions of the Indian model were beginning to emerge. Now, what happens at that moment in 2009? The 2014 election, in some senses, I mean, you know, which is the kind of first election after the financial crisis. Uh, remember, was fought on two planks, amongst other things. The plank of plutocracy and the plank of paralysis, policy paralysis, right? The claim was that while India had made all these strides in reforming the state, you know, in a centrist politics, in high growth, the two fundamental contradictions that were staring at us politically, one was plutocracy and corruption, right? Okay. That what growth had done was it had changed the structure of corruption without in some senses changing the scale and extent of it. Uh, in fact, many argued that, you know, 2034, 2014, that corruption had probably only grown. And the second was policy paralysis. Now, policy paralysis is in a sense an interesting term uh, because at one level, at one level, at one level, there was something to both of these critiques of UPA too. But policy paralysis also involves this thought that the distribution of social forces, these so-called vested interests that block reform, 
has become such that right the state or the government is not able to break through this log jam to advance the next generation of reforms okay so the 2014 election by at least the at least one of the background kind of conditions and discourses in it was anti plutocracy and anti paralysis now in hindsight one of the interesting things about both discourses and you know all of us participated in it we are probably as complicit in some ways in this is if you look at it globally anti corruption movements almost always there are few exceptions but almost always end up in an authoritarian direction okay they end up in an authoritarian direction in part because corruption becomes the pretext for giving the state more powers of surveillance rather than giving citizens more means of holding the state accountable they end up in an authoritarian direction because the sensibility they inculcate is that in some senses what you need is in a sense of purging of evil right the discourse of virtue becomes front and central to politics right and in politics the discourse of virtue uh, almost always is is not just moralistic in in some deep sense of the term but almost always always authoritarian so whether it's xi's china uh, whether it's brazil i mean you know anti corruption movements almost everywhere have created the space for a authoritarian politics the anti political paralysis movement right the sense that you know india is now in a long jam we have reaped the gains of growth but we now need hard decisions for the next stage if you think about what policy paralysis entails right what what is the claim involved in saying this is policy paralysis the claim is that the configuration of social forces will prevent progressive and reformist policies from being enacted right that's what policy paralysis means right now that's the fateful moment at which indian capital decided and i think it was not wrong in its analytical reading of what was going on in india that the only way in which it could get what it wanted was a political formation in a political regime that could overcome this political paralysis but how do you overcome political paralysis the only way you can overcome it the two ways of overcoming it right either you can convince everyone right uh there is a process in civil society in our public sphere where through the process of discussion argument debate representation uh the quotidian practices of politics you know we all get persuaded that these kinds of reforms are good for us and they have deep legitimacy indian capital got convinced that the likelihood of that happening in indian democracy was pretty much close to nil so what's the alternative the only alternative is a form of government that produces reform not by the process of collective will formation in the public sphere not through a process of representation but through a process of repression and suppression okay it's in a sense a structural requirement of in a sense indian capital saying right and 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 it's ubiquitous in our discourse i mean you know in 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 some senses the sense that democracy had become a fetter on economic india's economic modernization right that's a very quotidian expression of just this thought right boss if you want to get rich as a country you need to keep these forces down okay now indian capital's faustian bargain with the indian state right and 
by extension, Indian middle class, Indian elites, that the next stage of reform would require, quote unquote, strong government, right? What does strong mean? Strong means no matter what the balance of forces in society is, I can get my way, right? Irrespective of whether or not there is a consensus around a particular reform, right? So there were the economic conditions that in some senses were ripe for legitimizing in some senses, uh, you might say the greater authoritarian repression of Indian civil society, right? And you know, one of the interesting things about the farmers movement, why it's the first defeat for the Modi government that its supporters are very upset by, right? Everything else they can spin around right, is because it's cracked that particular facade. We elected you to get rid of vested interests, right, right? I mean, I'm not, now what is this nice talk about consensus and I was not able to persuade you and all of this stuff. This was not how it was supposed to be. I mean, in some, now it's not that Modi supporters will defect to any other political party. I won't hold my breath for that, but, you can in a, see, in a sense see the kind of the political significance of this, this moment, right? But Indian capital's Faustian bargain with authoritarianism actually then began to run much deeper. And, and I'll just spend a couple of minutes of this and sort of then try and conclude by what it means for civil society. So in the realm, as I said, of culture and society, uh, I mean, I haven't touched upon these kind of changes. Um, let me just state as a proposition that, of course, communalism began to take much greater hold in Indian electoral politics. I mean, the day BJP decided, in some senses, that the kind of majoritarianism that it was propagating was electorally sustainable, right? Uh, you could make minorities irrelevant. You could show them their space in some senses in, 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 in Indian politics for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, uh, you know, this would take a few hours in its own right, but, but I don't think it's news to any of this, this audience that besides the demand for authoritarianism, right? Which arises from the structural contradiction in the Indian economy. There is, in a sense, an autonomous dynamic towards greater communalization of Indian politics. And what we have right now, in a sense, is a deadly combination of authoritarianism and communalism, right? In one very organized configuration. The Faustian bargain that Indian capital also made was not just that we want to repress right? civil society, demand raising, right? all these nice troublesome RTI, RTI activists we can get rid of, right? uh, making the constitutional dead letter, all of that stuff, all of those forms, procedures, nice constitutional norms, you know, they're, they're all hindrances in thinking about India's rosy future. But, in order to legitimize this government, it will need a legitimizing ideology and the only possible legitimizing ideology is nationalism, right? In its most virulent and communal form. Now, I don't want to simplify this argument. I mean, at one level, this particular communal moment, I think has to be understood in a long history, particularly from 1857 onwards and the settlement that was bequeathed to South Asia in 1947. Uh, I mean, my own view for what it's worth is, I actually don't think now you can get uh, a kind of settlement to this issue unless there is a South Asia wide consensus uh, for moving to a regime of human rights and individual freedom rather than uh, in a sense, communal uh, and bigoted narcissism. But that apart, the fact that Indian capital decided that the only legitimizing ideology that can hold India together 
right, is Hindu nationalism. And that it was important to not just stay neutral, capital never takes on the state, capital never challenges the powers that be. I mean, all of you know that very, you know, perhaps rightly so. But the active participation and legitimization of this ideology. So you look at television ownership. I mean, you know, as you know, information orders are supply side orders. In, they are not driven only by demand. And in India, that's particularly the case. How is the supply side of this information order controlled, right? Could it be controlled without, in some senses, the active ideological conversion of India's elites and India, Indian capital in particular? Now, where are we sort of in these transitions? So, as I said, the state forms have gone, political centralism is gone, right? The economy is in this interesting stage where there is great skepticism that civil society, you know, while it might have been good for producing certain kinds of accountability, the RTI movement, social audits, all of these things, that civil society, there's a great skepticism that civil society can produce all things considered solutions to the complex problems that face India, right? Uh, does it have a solution? Can, can there be a form of conversation that produces a solution to the agrarian crisis? Can there be a form of conversation that produces, again, all things considered, right? A form of discursive conversation that has deep legitimacy, let's say around issues of the environment or India's growth model, right? In some senses, what was exposed in 2009 was that while two, civil society was important in producing certain forms of state accountability, its own structures of articulation and discussion, right? nobody had confidence that those could in some senses produce the kind of legitimate solutions that India's economy needs. And I think that sensibility still remains powerful, actually. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's going to be uh, Mr. Modi's kind of trump card. And last and finally, in the realm of culture, right? Where you have a hegemonic communal ideology that absolutely insists on colonizing pretty much all aspects of India's cultural life. The natural social divisions that we thought would act as a check and balance on the rise of this kind of ideology turned out to be pretty feeble. Again, there's a sociological dynamic, but, but you know, by and large, right? Uh, and, and, and I think part of it was a, for a good political reason, which I've sort of repeated many times that I think the left and the center were victims of their own complacency. We just assumed, you know, India has too many cross-cutting cleavages. No, no right-wing ideology can in a sense overcome those cross-cutting cleavages. Right. So where are we now? Now, what the BJP has tried to create, right, in some senses, I think the way, best way, you know, there are lots of epithets one can use, uh, electoral majoritarianism, electoral authoritarianism, electoral autocracy. But I think the one model that comes to mind is the creation of what we call party states where actually the models are communist parties. I think the Chinese Communist Party, but even in a limited sense, the left front government, I think in, in, in the years in Bengal, what are the features of a party state? The features of a party state is the claim that the party will knit together state and society and that all forms of social conflict, whether it's a cultural, whether it's economic, have to be mediated, right? Through, in some senses, a single party, okay? This claim extends to pretty much every aspect of social life. So universities, right? Uh, again, it's not that there wasn't government interference in universities, but in some senses, I think the BJP's sort of dream is, you know, to be like the left-friend government in Bengal used to be in some senses, which is uh, 
think of education system, right? As a structure that now has to be subordinate to the ideological imperatives of uh, a party. Capital. The day Ratan Tata decided to publicly felicitate Mohan Bhagwat, right? There can be no more chilling and symbolic sign of the fact that Indian capital not only cannot now not oppose the state, it has to actively participate in the kind of ideological mediation that this political party in a sense wants to produce. Religious institutions. Uh, the joke used, used to be about Hinduism that in some senses, you know, it's 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 a pluriflation of practices, faiths, rights, religions. I mean, you know, it's it's pluralism in a sense was supposed to be its strength. Uh, what the BJP has managed in some senses is to argue that this plurality of this religious configuration also now needs to be mediated through this overarching structure of the party's ideological goals. The BJP represents the single biggest reorganization and colonization of Hinduism ever in its history, right? Now, and that's the context in which the title of this talk, which is sort of the collapse of civil society, which is that once you're in a regime whose core architecture is that of a party state, every single conflict in society has to be mediated through the ideological lens of that party, right? Every single institution in society has to answer to the ideological lens of that party. Uh, there is no longer civil society left. I mean, I, by, by this, I don't mean there aren't brave people sort of trying to oppose the state. I mean, God knows there are lots and lots of them in some ways, right? But this formal structure of the regime form has no space for civil society. So when Mr. Doval, as he was reported saying, saying that civil society in a sense is a national security threat, right? He's speaking the unvarnished truth, right? When General Bipin Rawat thinks of civil society as a threat, they are speaking the unvarnished truth. Now, once you have a fatal combination of a party state, and in a sense, the collapse of that centrist political sensibility, right? in a sense, everything follows, which is you will get a repression of civil liberties. Uh, you will get uh, majoritarianism. You will get an erosion of federalism you will get the repression of civil society that you're seeing. And ask yourself this question, you know, and this is the thought I'll end with. When the reform process started, we said we want to emancipate ourselves from the state, right? In, in economics, in civil society. The one thing the last few years has taught us is that there is no realm of civil society now that exists outside of the mercy of the state. There is no private corporate sector in India in the technical sense of the term, right? I mean, the state can finish off any company in 30 seconds, right? Okay. So we are now in a regime, as I said, where the attempt will be to enfold all of civil society into the party state structure. Now, it will not succeed because of social and economic conditions in India. India is not China. The, the, the traditional cross-cutting cleavages still have some bite, all of that may be true. But we should be under no illusion, we should be under no illusion that the conventional politics that we pretend to engage in, there is a Supreme Court, there is an RTI commissioner, there are universities, there are think tanks, there, is, there are even TV channels, there is something called media, right? All that is, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Urdu phrase, I think from Harivan Shrai Bachchan, Farzadai, right? That is going through the forms, but for all practical purposes, civil society is dead. And to revive civil society, you would need in movement of the kind of scale and scope that our national movement was, right? Literally resting space after space from a party states that determined to shut us up.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta, for this very chillingly thought-provoking uh, talk. I, you know, you correctly said that we, our previous four speakers were jurists. And one of the reasons why we did not have a jurist and we wanted someone of your eminence and thank you so much for accepting our invitation was exactly the reason, you know, you have enlightened us today, which is that we kept looking at the judiciary as the one which will provide us the answer, the counterbalance to the executive. And I think increasingly everybody in the audience will agree that you can't depend on the judiciary anymore. And there's no point in listening to very eminent jurists who did their best in their time because we live in different times. But so many of the things that you've said are so chilling, including this thing about anti-corruption movements end up in authoritarian regimes. I'm sure a lot of people have not even given this a lot of thought. There's lots to think about, lots to discuss. I'm not going to stand in the way of 